Bonjour mes amis, this is Sophia Beaumont and I'm coming to you today with the first installment of an audiobook version of my first novel, The Spider's Web. Um, this is sort of an audiobook, sort of just me kind of reading it aloud to you. I've had a lot of requests for this and I wanted to go ahead and make it available. So I'm going to start today with the prologue. I'll be doing each chapter as an individual installment, and then once they're all up, I'll go ahead and compile them into one longer uh, video that you can listen to all at once. So I'm going to dive right in today. Um, like I said, this is from The Spider's Web. It was my first novel published in 2016, and we're starting off today with the prologue, which is Footloose and Shoelace Free. I hope you enjoy. They say that for a good story to work, you can't ever quit. You have to fight to overcome all obstacles to reach your goal. The funny thing is, my story began when I gave up. I've spent my entire life trying to obtain uniformity. I went to Catholic school. I wore the uniforms. I did my best to keep up with the other kids and to never go past them. That's why I like to knit and crochet so much. Every stitch is uniform, exactly the same. It's calming. Nothing stands out unless I want it to. I can control the shape it takes, the color, the texture. There's always been someone telling me how to speak, what to wear, how to spend my free time. But this is one thing that I can control. Dr. Fisher nodded sagely, eyes closed. The other three members of the group clapped politely. The public speaking portion of the session completed, I relaxed my grip on the slipper I was crocheting ever so slightly. Thank you, Evie. You've made some great progress in the past few weeks, she said. Her curly blonde hair fought valiantly against the clip, binding it in place. One spring-like lock bounced loose and flipped in front of her gaudy glasses. Today's selections were lime green with rhinestones. I swear she had a different pair for every day of the week, maybe every day of the month. The doctor checked her watch. That's all we have time for right now. Same time tomorrow, everyone. We mumbled our farewells and shuffled off in different directions. I folded up my metal chair and slid it into a corner with the others. A hand touched my shoulder. Evie, would you join me in Dr. Sanchez's office? I nodded, following Dr. Fisher out of the common room down the long hallway of St. Mary's. I'd always thought mental hospitals would have white walls and padded cells. We'd wear uniforms and spend our days on hard leather couches talking about our feelings to doctors with German accents and thick white mustaches. The reality was a bit different. St. Mary's reminded me of a cross between an elementary school and the office of my childhood pediatrician. Soothing colors with names like seafoam and mellow butter and clear skies covered the walls. Patient artwork hung from bulletin boards in plastic cases. Maybe the adult ward was a little different, but it, since I was only 17, I had to share a ward with kids as young as seven, though there wasn't much overlap in our schedules. Dr. Fisher buzzed me through the first set of doors to where most of the exam rooms were. Dr. Sanchez, who was in charge of the minor ward, had the last office on the left. Now this is just preliminary, nothing to worry about, but I think you'll do great. We'll get you back to your family in no time. Fantastic. After three months, I was more than ready to get out. I just wanted my own room with my own things back. I was never able to get used to nuthouse pillows. Dr. Sanchez was tall and Latin. He did have a mustache, but it wasn't overly bushy and only beginning to go gray. Evie, he boomed. He always boomed when he said his patient's names. Have a seat. He gestured to the two vinyl-covered chairs across from him. Dr. Fisher and I each took one while he shuffled his notes. I've been hearing good things about you, he said at last. You've made a lot of progress since you came to us. How do you feel? I swallowed, taking a deep breath. I feel fine. It wasn't a lie, not really. I felt a lot better. Almost normal, or at least as close to it as I ever got. I still have my moments, but I understand it's something I'll have to work on at least for the next few months, if not the rest of my life. There isn't a magic bullet to make depression go away, but I think I've learned how to handle it a bit better now. Good to hear. Now, what about your delusions? There was some concern right after you came to us that there was more wrong than just a simple case of chronic depression, at least as simple as that ever is. Any relapses? I pointedly did not look over my shoulder. His hand was there, his attempt to reassure me such that it was. Average height, curly reddish hair with a streak of silver that matched his eyes, but a face younger than either indicated. 
I could smell the ozone and leather from his jacket, hear the rustle of his blue jeans when he moved. He'd been there since I woke up in the ICU. Just like we rehearsed, he said. I looked Dr. Sanchez in the eye. No, none at all. Despite what Dr. Sanchez and Dr. Fisher said, I wasn't in any rush to go home. When I woke up in the hospital, groggy and sore, my hands still partially numb from the rough incisions I'd made in my wrists with a butcher knife, it wasn't my mom and dad who were waiting for me. Uncle Mike had a day's growth of beard and, a, and deep shadows under his eyes. One hand partially obscured his face, but he was the picture of misery. On my other side, his younger sister, Izzy, squeezed my hand and leaned forward at the first signs of life. Evie, are you awake, honey? she asked. At first I was confused. What are you doing here? I croaked through dry lips. You're supposed to be in Montreal. I drove down right away when I heard what happened, she said. There were tears in her eyes as she stroked my hair. Across from her, my strong, fun-loving police detective uncle didn't say a word, merely dissolved into tears and clutched my hand. I didn't know what to say or do. I was still a little out of it. Half a bottle of nighttime painkillers and massive blood loss will do that, I guess. I spent a couple of days in intensive care before being sent to the psych ward. At first, they thought the people I kept seeing in my room were an after-effect of all the medications and the trauma. There was the guy with the shredded left side who looked like he'd been hit by a car. He kept wandering up and down the hallway at night howling for someone named Betty, but she never answered. And then there was the lady in the old-fashioned pink striped uniform with the little cap who kept coming in and offering me cigarettes and candy. She was nice enough, but a little weird. She kept talking about soldiers. But she kept most of the others out of my room, which was good. That just left the one with the silver eyes. He watched me patiently from the corner, looking as wrung out as Uncle Mike. Unlike the others, he didn't leave. Sometimes I couldn't see him, but I knew he was still there. You can't tell them I'm here. That any of us are here, he warned, after I'd asked Mike and Izzy for the umpteenth time who the weird guy in my room was. They can't see us. They'll lock you up for good if you keep asking questions. Slowly, I learned. I adjusted to the rhythm of the hospital and then the ward. I learned not to flinch when the maimed or out of place walked by, sometimes walking straight through walls or even other people. I learned what to say and how to say it. And the whole time, I stitched like crazy, uncertain if I was more afraid to stay or go. Knitting helped keep me calm through my three-month stay. It wasn't until the last week of March that I was fit enough to go home, but once the doctors made their decisions, things moved quickly. Home was just as inhospitable as I remembered. My parents barely knew what to do with me when I was sane, let alone when I was straight out of the psych ward. We fought constantly, and when we weren't fighting, I was invisible. It was just like before. The blackness crept over me again within hours. I lay on my bed, hugging my pillow and trying to ignore the specter on the other side of the room. I wondered at the wisdom of keeping him to myself. If I'd told the doctors, they would have kept me longer. They would have put me on even more pills, they'd have had even worse side effects, and there was no promise they would even work. But I was good at ignoring him. Ignoring, I could do, and it seemed to be working. I hugged my pillow as tightly as I could. You need to get up. You need to do something. You can't just sit here and wallow like a baby. You're too old for this. All of my affirmations seemed to float out of my mind when faced with the disappointed, angry look on my mother's face. He rested his hand on mine. Evie, you are not too old. You are not wallowing. I peered at him around the pillowcase. He gave me a lopsided smile. Well, maybe a little. It's not wrong for you to come home and want understanding. You're not out of line in wanting them to care for you. You need to stand on your own, sure, but you also need to ask for help every once in a while. I buried my head back into the pillow. What do you know? I'm not taking psychiatric advice from a hallucination. <sighs> he sighed. I'm not a hallucination. And that wasn't advice, that was fact. If you want advice, here's some. Get the hell out. You shouldn't be here. You should be anywhere but here. This place is toxic for you. Find some place, any place, where you'll be safe. Right. Where was I going to go? I'd barely made it out of high school, and I was unemployed. I didn't have any friends I could stay with long term, and there was no way I could pay rent. Staying with one of my multitude of relatives would be even worse. The only one I was really close to was Uncle Mike, but he had enough on his plate. And after, well, I just couldn't. I couldn't do that to him. Izzy. 
I looked at him over the pillow again. Ask to stay with Izzy. She'll say yes, and a change in scenery will do you good. So that was how I wound up moving 500 kilometers to Montreal. So that is the end of the prologue. I will be back soon for chapter one. I hope you guys enjoyed this, and I hope that the sounds of my cats in the background wasn't too disruptive. If you have any questions or comments, just leave them down below, and make sure that you like and subscribe and ring the bell so you'll be notified about when the next chapter goes up. So thanks you guys for listening, and I will see you guys next time.